It's fire season, and anyone who fights Tennessee forest fires knows what that means. Long days, a lot of hard work, and that sheer rush of adrenaline when you're out there on the fire lines, working safe, smart, and efficient to protect property and to protect lives. Anyone who fights Tennessee forest fires also knows just how dangerous they can be. That's why it's important to go into any fire situation knowing exactly what to do. Having the skills, the proper gear, the right tools and equipment to be safe and to get the job done. In most cases, hand tools will be your weapon of choice and later you'll see a basic safe and efficient method for suppressing most of Tennessee's wildland forest fires. Now, I don't say all wildland forest fires because, as you know, there are situations where it's entirely too dangerous to use hand tools alone. Let's take a look at the rules. Never attack a forest fire using only hand tools if there are medium to high winds, the winds keep shifting, or the weather forecaster is calling for a front to come through, the fire is burning hot enough to roar, jump, and swirl, the fire is burning in the tops of trees, which we call a crown fire, or the fire is burning in a plantation of small pines. If any of these conditions exist, it's too dangerous to attempt to suppress the fire using only hand tools. Instead, you'll want to call for backup from the Forestry Division's heavy equipment. Okay, so we're straight on when to use hand tools. Now let's go learn some strategies. Hey, Keith. Hey, how you doing? Oh, well, pretty good. <laughs> Keith here is an expert using hand tools. Looks like you're dressed for the occasion. Yes, well, this is what the well-dressed firefighters are wearing this season. Uh, approved fire retardant clothing, sturdy leather boots, leather gloves, and approved hard hats. Why not your standard bunker gear? Uh, they're too hot. What I'm wearing is light. You don't want to run the risk of overheating during a fire. Okay, like you would wearing your standard gear. Exactly. Okay, so let's take a time out here, Keith, to look at the personal protective equipment, or PPE, that all firefighters are required to have. First, the hard hat. Now, it should be an approved hard hat with a chin strap, and we really encourage you to have reflective tape on it, something like scotch light. Under no conditions should Division of Forestry personnel wear metal hard hats. Your boots must be 100% leather uppers, they need to be at least eight inches high, lace up, and have skid resistant soles. Fire resistant clothing must be loose fitting, either trousers with cuffs and a long sleeve shirt, or coveralls made of fire resistant materials. Any clothing worn under the fire clothes must be 100% cotton. That means no polyester, no nylon, no materials that could be flammable. Your gloves must be leather, and you should always wear eye protection when you're operating a blower. Hearing protection is required, too, when you're operating an open cab tractor plow, a tractor, a blower, or a gasoline engine-driven pumper. Finally, you must have an approved fire shelter. Shelters need to be inspected and replaced if they're defective. It's basically a one-person shelter that protects you by reflecting radiant heat and by trapping breathable air inside. You use it as a last resort, only if you can't get to your planned escape routes or safety zones. Firefighters receive special training on how to use these shelters. Well, now we know the protective gear, let's take a look at the tools. Oh, come on back. Well, I wouldn't call it anything fancy. <laughs> yeah, well, it gets the job done every time, so who's complaining? The leaf blower and the rakes are used to clear a path in the woods in order to create a fire break. The chainsaw is used to cut snags and trees away from the fire line. And the Pulaski is used to cut and dig out dead roots. Or you can use them to trench the line in order to catch rolling debris. So what's the basic strategy here? Pretty simple. It takes three things to make a forest fire burn. heat air, and fuel, your basic fire triangle. You take away any one of the three and the fire goes out. What we found to be the safest and most effective method for putting out a fire is to remove the fuel. Okay, well, let's see how it works. We'll take it in steps. The first step is to size up the fire. When we reach a fire, we size it up to find out which direction it seems to be moving the fastest and where it can be most easily and safely stopped. 
We look for things like natural fire barriers, potential hazards, and houses or other structures that need special protection. We also look for other firefighters who might already be on the scene. Once our size up is completed, we report our findings to our dispatch center. If we need additional help from heavy equipment, we ask for it, and we wait until it arrives. If we feel we can safely handle the fire with our hand tools, we begin our initial attack. We go directly to a point a safe distance in front of the fastest moving portion of the wildfire. That's where we start our fire suppression efforts. We call this action attacking the head of the fire. Experience has taught us that the key to quickly stopping forest fires in Tennessee is stopping the head of the fire. Once the head of the fire is controlled, the rest of the fire can be put out with relative ease. Don't control the head and the fire will usually spread faster than we can suppress it using hand tools. Now notice that when we reach the head of the fire, we don't directly attack the flames. We back up a safe distance and begin constructing our control lines, or what we often call fire lines. An indirect attack like this saves you time and energy. Here you see the fire lines being built all the way around the fire. We found that cutting off the head of the fire by making a smooth fire line around the fire's perimeter is much safer and more effective than following the twists and turns of the forest fire. Now, it's true that we sometimes lose more acreage to the fire this way, but to be honest, the additional acreage that's actually involved is surprisingly little. Looking at our diagram, we see that when we're constructing our fire lines, we're working both sides of the fire at the same time. Let's take a look at how that works. First, we divide ourselves into two equal crews and assign each crew responsibility for one half of the fire. We start together at the same point, directly in front of the head fire. Working away from each other, we use our fire rakes and leaf blowers to construct a fire break. Sometimes our line is not very wide, but we make sure that it's dug all the way to damp turf or mineral soil, just like you see here. We don't want places left where the fire can creep across the line. We want it free of any leaves, vines, or dead limbs. A good fire line like the one we've constructed here is longer than the head of the fire is wide. Once we've completed it, we begin the burnout process. We carefully start and control a backing fire along the inside edge of our fire line. We burn this fire into the wildfire beginning at the same point where we began our line. Let's take a look. Watch how we spread our backfire slowly and carefully down the inside edge of our fire line. Just like we did in constructing the fire line, we work both sides of the wildfire at the same time. In this way, we create a wide area where there is no fuel left to burn. The backing fire and the wildfire burn together and both go out. And let me just caution you to always make sure you backfire on the same side of the line the wildfire is on. Otherwise, your backfire will become a new wildfire. Now, while some crew members are busy starting and controlling the backfire, others patrol the lines to make sure that no fire crosses over and starts a new wildfire. If fire does cross the line, we call the event a breakover and attack as though it were a new forest fire. Here you see the crew going to work on a small breakover. While patrolling for breakovers, we also look for anything burning that shouldn't be burning. Snags, logs, stumps, chunks of wood or pine cones. Anything that might eventually fall or roll over the fire line and start a new fire. What you see here are called mop-up activities. Cutting down the snag, digging trenches in the line to catch rolling debris, wetting down the hot spot, or widening the line around the danger area any potential threat to the line is taken care of. We continue to patrol, continue our mop-up activities until there's no live fire close enough to the fire line to cause a breakover. As you can see, the crew's done a good job. They've carefully gone through all the steps in the process. They've used their hand tools effectively, they've worked safely and efficiently, and the result is a forest fire that's soon under control or completely out with little chance of starting up again. Like you said, remove the fuel and the fire goes out. That's it in a nutshell. Well, your crew makes it look pretty simple. <laughs> well, fighting a fire is not always easy, and you can never forget how dangerous a fire can be. 
especially if you're fighting a forest fire on a steep slope. Well, that's got to be fairly common here in East and Middle Tennessee. Happens all the time. I've seen the paint melted off a fire truck because they parked the truck on the road above the fire. <laughs> they thought the road was going to stop the fire. Wow, I guess not, huh? No. So what should you do? Well, let's have a look at the diagram. Rule number one is to go to the top of the slope to stop the head of the fire. You want to put your fire line back from the edge of the slope to get out of the wind, smoke, and danger from the oncoming fire. Here's why that's so important. Take a look at this fire in Campbell County. You can see the fire in the tops of those trees. If you weren't far enough back, that fire would be on you in no time. That's why you want to put your fire line on the other side of the slope. Rule number two, watch for unexpected wild fire coming up from below. Forest fires often form more than one head when burning up slope. Not noticing the second head fire may put the crew in danger. Rule number three, make sure the line on top reaches farther in each direction than the fire is wide at the bottom. Otherwise, the crew might get caught above a new head fire as they attempt to build control lines down the sides of the fire. As you can see in this diagram, the fire line around the fire allows for plenty of room on all sides. Rule number four, burn out the top as soon as possible to keep the wildfire from reaching the top of the slope and jumping the control line. So even as your crew is constructing the fire line down the sides of the slope, you should have already started your backing fire at the top. Rule number five, keep the crew together toward the top of the slope until the head fire and backing fire burn together and go out. In this way, everyone will be able to help with breakover without having to climb very far back up the steep slope. Rule number six, stay out of heavy brush and put control lines down the tops of side ridges or other high ground. Never put them in high draws or hollows. There's too much fuel there, and fire is often sucked up through those places with great intensity. In fact, they act like a natural chimney. When a fire starts to move through them, it moves very fast, which gives you very little time for escape. Now, speaking of which, how would you get out of a situation like that? Move. Rule number seven. If your crew is caught on the side of a steep slope with a fire coming up from below, you should walk quickly to the safety zone along the side of the oncoming fire instead of up or down the slope. As you can see here, fires running up slope can move fast and they burn fast. But fortunately, in eastern fuels, they're usually not very wide. Often moving a few steps to the left or right of the oncoming head fire are all you need to do to get out of the way of danger. Looking again at our diagram, notice that the side control lines go straight down to the bottom of the slope. That's rule eight. You don't want your lines to lean in toward the fire. That could allow burning debris to roll over and start a new fire. Same goes for lines that flare out. They're susceptible to breakovers caused by the burnout process. So just like you see our crew doing here, make your side control lines straight. On to rule number nine. Do not burn out from the bottom of the slope. Just let the side fires burn together. That'll keep down the damage to the trees in the burn area. Putting a control line across the slope under the wildfire is something we call undercutting. And according to Rule 10, undercutting's not a good idea. It seldom works because you've got too many burning chunks and pine cones that can roll across the control line and cause breakovers. So that's it. Ten important rules to keep in mind when fighting a steep slope fire. Straight control lines at the top and the sides, but not in hollows no undercuttings, and move if you have to. But always to the side. Gotcha. Look, the point is, when you're fighting a fire, you're trying to control the fire. And you control the fire by removing the fuel. And knowing how to use hand tools safely and efficiently. Right, and I've said it before and I'm going to say it again. Fighting forest fires using hand tools can be a very dangerous proposition. Yeah, we talked earlier about the conditions that make it unsafe to use hand tools. The medium to high winds, shifting winds or a front coming through, a fire that's hot enough to roar, jump, and swirl, or if the fire is burning in the top of the trees, mm -hmm. 
or if it's burning in a plantation of small pines. And what would you do in that situation? In that situation, you'll want to call for backup from the Forestry Division's heavy equipment. Sounds like you know what you're doing. Oh, you're the expert. Well, it looks like we're about done here. Can I give you a ride back up to the road? Oh, sure. See you on the fire line.